have today Dr. Michael King, OBE. He, fortunately for us, is a Kiwi. Journalist, author and producer, he has been recognised with academic post scholarships such as the Catherine Mansfield and Fulbright, various Book of the Year awards in 78, 84 and 90, and Feltex TV award in 91. He likes reading, walking, fishing, bird watching, and planting trees. And he lives in the Coromandel, so he's well placed to enjoy those things. He's married with two children. We hope, Dr. King, that you enjoy your experience today of talking to us, allegiance to one's origins, the consequences of belief. Thank you, Susie, for that introduction. Oops. <clears throat> I may have a bit of difficulty today. Um, I've just acquired a set of spectacles with graduated lenses and I'm not quite accustomed to using them. <laughs> I've got my reading glasses on hand in case I have to switch to them. Um, can I begin by telling you that whenever I have to go to sleep in places I haven't visited before, I look for signs or portents that uh, illustrate the culture of those places. Um, a couple of years ago in Dunedin I stayed in a motel where a little notice on the vanity unit said guests are forbidden to hold praties in their room. P-R-A-T-I-E-S. <laughs> this was an extremely curious thing to forbid people from doing and as a person of Irish descent <laughs> I felt I had the right to hold praties wherever I damn well liked but when I checked with the front desk, they told me that it was a misprint, that it was supposed to read parties. <laughs> well, here at Woodford House, my eye was caught last night by two messages that, that seemed actually contradictory in character. One on the landing upstairs said, please do not wear your pyjamas outside the boarding house. <coughs> well... <laughs> Well, it, 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 it never occurred to me to try and do that. <laughs> but the, the second, which was um, a, a magnetic sign stuck to the fridge in my room, read, last pub for 240 kilometres. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, I still haven't worked out the significance of those two messages. <laughs> um, Somewhat more seriously, last night I began to have worries about the relevance of uh, what I propose to say to you. I've never forgotten the shock and the indignation which occurred at a conference in New Zealand writing at Victoria University in 1959 when um, the eminent cultural historian Dr. Eric McCormick was asked to open the conference with a paper on the state of New Zealand literature today. And what he did was he talked about growing up in Taihapi. And <laughs> Monty Holcroft, in particular, who was the chairman of the conference, reprimanded him publicly. Uh, not just once, but twice. He did it in his memoirs as well. <laughs> um, with that in mind, it might be drawing a long bow to put what I want to say this morning in the context of the theme of the conference. But I'll do it anyway. The broad query I want to raise is who do Pākehā people believe they are? What is the nature of their culture? How does that culture relate to the land of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and how does it relate to the Tangata Whenua culture, that of Māori? Depending on the answers to these questions, which of course are questions of belief, one then asks what are the consequences of those beliefs? How might behaviour reflect them, or how ought it to do so? And this, I submit, puts my topic directly into the beyond belief theme which frames this uh, particular gathering. I propose addressing these questions because they've arisen from a particular journey which I've made in my own life in New Zealand. In the course of that journey, some odd juxtapositions have occurred, uh, some unexpected insights perhaps been sparked, and I've witnessed a great deal of discussion and sometimes conflict 
generated by this whole topic. A second reason relates to why I revised and republished last year a book I had originally written nearly two decades earlier, uh, a book called Being Pākehā. Um, in the introduction to the new edition, uh, this one, published last year, I said that the first book arose from what I saw 20 years before as a need to make Māori preoccupations and expectations intelligible to Pākehā New Zealanders to make it clear why I believed that Māori had every right to be Māori in their own country and to expect Pākehā to respect and support them in that mission. Two decades on, however, at the beginning of the 21st century AD, I noted a rather different but equally pressing need to help explain Pākehā New Zealanders to Māori and to themselves and to do so in terms of their right to live in this country to practice their cultures and values and to be themselves. And I was impelled to move in this direction by a variety of stimuli, including the anguished cry, cry of children's writer Jack Lazenby, who asked in a landfall essay, <clears throat> does belief in pluralism mean one must betray one's own civilization for another's? And that question was provoked by a fear that he could only value the restored place of Maori culture in our national life by devaluing or condemning the role of his own culture, which had been that of the colonizers of the Tanga de Venua. These are the circumstances then which conditioned my choice of topic. Um, let me now address that topic by saying a little more about the first version of this book called Being Pākehā. Some people, some reviewers of the book, and others who commented on it on radio and in the print media, characterised it as the work of a sickly white liberal sucking up to Māori culture and begging to be let into its inner sanctum. The grossest expression of this view came in a letter I received from a Hamilton reader who told me that I was what was known in the United States as a nigger lover and that I had betrayed my own culture and people. Well, needless to say that went fairly smartly into the waste paper basket and it was a caricature of the book's approach and content. I had been intent on describing my experience of coming into contact with what used to be called things Māori in the belief that it was a kind of encounter that would eventually be shared by all Pākehā New Zealanders and that all Pākehā New Zealanders ought to be prepared for it. But at the time I had that experience, from the mid-1960s to the early 1970s, I felt very strong in my own sense of identity as a Pākehā New Zealander with Irish Catholic antecedents. <clears throat> I felt very much in accord, and I still do, with both my living culture and my culture of origin. While we all, if we are healthy human beings, remain open to the influences and the richness of new experience, I was not, and I am not, an empty vessel waiting to be filled up with and consoled by somebody else's culture. What I did feel, however, and tried to convey in the book, was a welcome congruence of some of the inclusive qualities of tikanga Māori, Māori custom, and taha Māori, Māori protocol, with aspects of my own Irish Catholic experience. A love of language and eloquence. How much the function and the customs of tangihanga resemble those of the Irish wake. An easy resort to song and story to convey the substance of a culture and to express group solidarity and mutual support, an enjoyment of physical as well as emotional closeness. This was in no way tantamount to saying I was Māori or wanted to be Māori because I couldn't be Māori and have no wish to be. It was rather something we all take consolation from at some stages of our lives, celebrating those things that we, celebrating those things that have resonance from one culture to another, those things that remind us that in addition to being Māori and Pākehā, male and female, gay and straight, we are also human. And there are times when we, need, when we need to be reminded of that fact and to cross the bridges to one another with which experience provides us. I was recently reminded of this primal need to find and sustain the humanity in each one of us by something Janet Frame said in a letter to a friend just after the death by drowning of her sister Isabel almost 10 years to the day after her older sister, Myrtle, had died the same way. <clears throat> we are such 
We are such sad, small people, she wrote, standing each alone in a circle, trying to forget that death and terror are near. But death comes and terror comes, and then we join hands and the circle is really magic. We have the strength then to face terror and death, even to laugh and make fun of being alive, and after that even to make more music and writing and dancing. But always deep down, we are small, sad people standing humanly alone. Oh, for the hands to be joined forever and the magic circle never to be broken. I want now to turn to the, the nature of Pākehā culture as I perceive it and the question of how it relates to this land. I was going to begin this section with a discourse about culture in general and how we use and understand the term, but because much of that, I think, on reflection is self-evident, I'll skip over it and simply uh, read my conclusion, which is that cultures, at one end of the scale, provide us with understanding of ourselves as particular people alive at particular places at particular times, and at the other, they simply distract us from the realities we find too harsh to contemplate unrelievedly. Culture is, in the end, the sum total of what people do to enable themselves to cope with reality. In using the word Pākehā, the other part of that um, concept of Pākehā culture, I refer to those things that relate to New Zealand but which are not specifically Māori or Pacific Island in character. I refer, in other words, to mainstream New Zealand culture, which is not unaffected by things Māori, but which is not in itself Māori. And I prefer to use the term Pākehā because it is positive, as opposed to non-Māori, because it is an indigenous New Zealand expression, and because the words European or Caucasian are no longer accurate or appropriate. And of course the word Caucasian never was. Pākehā is not a pejorative expression. It does not mean long pig, white flea, turnip, or buggier, all of which have been cited as alleged meanings by those who find the term distasteful. It almost certainly comes from the Māori expression Pāke Pākehā, which was a reference to the white complexion of the earliest non-Māori who stepped ashore here, whose main visible distinguishing feature was that the colour of their skin was paler than that of Māori. In identifying my own culture as Pākehā, I do so as one who has always taken for granted the fact that I belong in this land. In choosing a New Zealand label for that culture, one that has no significance anywhere else in the world, is a way of emphasising that fact. It's true that there was in my childhood a notion that we could have been displaced Irish, but that receded as I grew up. My people, predominantly remnants of the Irish diaspora, came here to a country where the first indigenous people had made a treaty with the Crown that authorised colonisation and gave us those two streams of people with rights to be here. Tangata Whenua, by virtue of their prior occupation, and Tangata Treaty, to use Eddie Dury's characterisation of them, those who came to settle here as a result of the signing of the treaty and the constitutional steps that set in motion. After several generations of my family's occupation of this land, my own sense of belonging to it, and hence the flavour of my own culture, includes some of the following ingredients. A strong relationship with the natural world, which is intensified by living by the sea, by boating, fishing, tramping, camping, those kinds of activities. An engagement with the history of the land, which began with my boyhood encounters with Kainga, whaling and battle sites, um, around Parramatta Harbour. A relationship with the literature of this country, especially the writing of such people as Robin Hyde, Charles Brash, Frank Sargison, Eric McCormick, Keith Sinclair, James K. Baxter. And a relationship with Maori people, Maori writing and Maori history, which affects my view of all the preceding elements. My identification with Pākehā culture is also a consequence of an accumulation of other New Zealand attitudes values and habits which accrue to one living here. I'm referring to such things as rugby culture, which absorbed almost all New Zealand males of my generation and those immediately preceding it. A willingness to have a go at any kind of job opportunity that presented itself and to learn about the job on the job. 
And in this context, I recall Stephanie Dyrick saying that in London publishing houses, an English staff member could edit a manuscript or tie up a paper parcel, whereas a New Zealander in the same office could do both. <laughs> a concern for the underdog, compassion for those in need or in trouble, an unwillingness to be bullied or to be intimidated by class or status, not undertaking to do something without seeing it through, what Dan Davin, in a very New Zealand metaphor, referred to as a kind of power behind the scrum that was often lacking in one's more fastidious English colleagues. Another ingredient in this equation is having New Zealand heroes and heroines and role models. And for me, they were such people I knew about from childhood as Cliff Porter, the captain of the Invincibles, who was our neighbour, J.T. Paul, another neighbour, Dennis Glover, Charles Upham, Suzanne Aubert, Francois Delac, and later such figures as Robin Hyde, William Malone, Howard Kippenberger, Ormond Wilson, Frank Sargison, Eric McCormick, and Janet Frame. There were also Māori who became part of my personal pantheon, Te Fiti o Rongomai, Te Rao o Te Rangi, Huria Matenga, Te Puya, Sir James Henry, Fina Cooper, and I would have to say, having access to Māori experience and Māori role models is one of the features that distinguishes Pākehā culture from its cultures of origin. Pākehā culture shares some ingredients with its larger European cultures of origin, such as the English language, the Westminster parliamentary system, the traditions and the conventions of the open society, in which every person is entitled to seek truth through a process of unfettered investigation and open disputation. And what a marvellous example of the exercise of the raison d'etre for the open society was Don Cupid's clear-headed, if disputatious, presentation last night. But the forms and the proportions in which these imported ingredients have coalesced in New Zealand has made them somewhat different in character from their antecedents and hence characteristic of Pākehā culture rather than of European culture. If anyone doubts this, they have only to travel abroad to do the much-valued OE to discover that this is so. And what one discovers, of course, is that one may feel a sense of affinity in places such as England, or in my case, Ireland or Scotland, but that sense of affinity is not the same as feeling at home. In fact, no sooner is one separated for a substantial time from New Zealand voices, viewpoints, or even a sense of humour, then one misses those things and knows oneself to be from and of New Zealand and not from and of any other place on earth. Travel overseas at the age of 30 confirmed and emphasised for me that it is New Zealand and its experience and traditions, Māori and Pākehā, that is in my bones and that there is no other part of the globe in which I would want to live or could live with the same sense of belonging and enrichment. Among the subsequent experiences that have sharpened that feeling for me are being informed by members of the Ahika group that I was, in fact, a Tauiwi or foreigner in this land, and, just as offensively to me, listening to Cabinet Minister Doug Graham say that Māori people had spiritual feelings for lakes, rivers and mountains and that Pākehā people did not. Doug Graham may not have those feelings. <laughs> But I and my family have them, as have the thousands of other Pākehā people I have encountered in four decades of walking, tramping and camping on this beautiful land, and doing their best to preserve the contours and the character of Papa Tuanuku from a variety of commercial interests which have sought to modify or destroy that character by ill-considered development projects. It's for all these reasons that I would now say what I did not go as far as saying two decades ago, that Pākehā culture can no longer be considered an imported culture. It has now been here long enough in interaction with the land and the Tangata Whenua to be considered a second indigenous culture. And it has become indigenous in the same way that East Polynesian culture became Māori by turning the attention of migrants away from their land and culture of origin and focusing their sense of commitment to this land, the one in which they live. Just one indication of how far Pākehā have moved in this direction in the course of two generations 
can be gauged, of course, from the New Zealand response to the Second World War. In 1939, a New Zealand Prime Minister could say, where Britain goes, we go, where she stands, we stand. And 105,000 New Zealanders, including my father and two uncles, served abroad in response to that call to defend Britain, Europe, and something called the British Empire. That cannot happen and won't ever happen in the future. New Zealanders would only ever take up arms again on that scale to defend New Zealand. In the new edition of Being Pākehā, I go on to say that as another indication of how far Pākehā culture has become indigenous, it's only right to see the Macrocarpa and the wooden church as being as emblematic of the New Zealand landscape and human occupation of it as the meeting house and the cabbage tree. In saying this, and in saying what preceded this, I am in no way taking anything away from the position of Māori as tangata whenua, the nation's first culture. Māori were, are, and will remain the tuakana, or the senior sibling, in our joint relationship with the land, <coughs> with each other, and with the outside world. They remain the people who, by virtue of having been, there, been here first, signed with the Crown a treaty that is still recognised as having moral and judicial force. And I'm fully supportive of the fact that it does. But having said that, I will not willingly allow anyone to demean or diminish the status of my culture in the process of establishing or elevating that of Māori. And that brings me to the relevance of the Jack Lazenby quotation I mentioned earlier. There are several grounds for resisting the notion that respect for Māori implies disrespect for one's own heritage if that heritage can be seen to have disadvantaged Māori. One is that I don't believe in the Old Testament notion that the sins of the fathers are or should be vested on successive generations. That is a prescription for the kind of payback culture that has crippled such places as the Balkans and Northern Ireland for centuries. Further, if one accepted such a principle, it would also be a recipe for continued conflict between Māori and Māori as a consequence of the musket wars of the early 19th century and earlier conflicts. Then there are the potentially difficult implications for those who are both Māori and Pākehā descent. It is in that latter circumstance, however, that we have a precedent for a way forward and out of a culture of revenge. In the pre-musket, pre-contact years, when Māori iwi or hapu fought other iwi or hapu and one side achieved clear dominance, the descendants of both victor and vanquished were married so that their descendants could whakapapa back to both sides. And that was a prescription for ending the distinction between victor and vanquished and thus removing grounds for future conflict. In this way did Ngāti Mamoi absorb Waitaha in the South Island and then were themselves absorbed by Ngaitahu and in this way, too, most Ngaitahu descendants now trace their descent from all three iwi. The sins of the father's model also loses validity if one takes it literally, case by case. When North Island Māori were being attacked by imperial and then colonial government forces in the middle of the 19th century, my immediate ancestors were grappling with the effects of the Irish famines, and my tyranny grandmother always asserted that we with 400 years of oppression of our language, our culture and our faith behind us, had more reason to hate the English than those who had survived the decidedly more mild consequences of 19th century colonisation. That is not to say that one should devalue or underestimate the effect on Māori of the British colonisation of Aotearoa. I have researched and documented the pain and the grief of that process in half a dozen books, and done as much as I can to make the negative effects of that colonisation visible to my Pākehā brothers and sisters, and argued forcefully that it created imbalances of opportunity in our national life that can and ought to be compensated for and remedied, which is one reason that I'm fully supportive of the treaty-based claims process and applaud the fact that it returns economic and social resources to people who had had those things illegally or unethically taken from them. But that is not the same thing as saying that Māori people or Māori culture are ethically or morally superior to Pākehā because of the European colonisation of New Zealand. That is a notion I would wholly reject. The process of colonisation is about the application of power on the part of those who have it 
onto those who do not. And it is almost inevitably corrupting, as Lord Acton reminded us when speaking of the absolute variety. And it brings with it, as part of its baggage, notions of racial and cultural superiority. Note, I say, that it is the process that brings these things, not simply people of one kind of ethnic background or another. In pre-European contact days, tribal Māori interacted only with each other. And those people, Ngā iwi o tamotu, people of the land, <coughs> while there were small variations in their language and kawa, recognised a broad tikanga, or group of customs, that were intelligible to and accepted by people from Te Riringa Wairua in the north to Rakiura in the south. In the first half of the 19th century, however, individual iwi considered carrying their martial culture beyond the shores of New Zealand. At least three expeditions of conquest were planned by Māori in the 1830s, to Samoa, to Norfolk Island, and to the Chatham Islands, which did not become part of New Zealand until 1842. All these proposed expeditions, of course, were dependent on finding transport to those places, and that meant finding a European ship's captain whose vessel was available for charter, or it meant Māori commandeering a vessel for the purpose. In the event, there were no expeditions to Norfolk Island or to Samoa because the necessary transport was not secured. And one has a certain amount of regret about that. It would have been quite interesting to know what would have come of those expeditions. But there was an invasion of the Chatham Islands. Two Taranaki tribes, then based in Wellington, Ngāti Tama and Ngāti Mutonga Kiponeki, hijacked the European vessel in 1835 and had themselves, a total of 900 people, delivered to the Chatham Islands. There they takahid or walked the land to claim it, ritually killed around 300 Chatham Island Moriori out of a total of around 1,600 and enslaved the survivors, separating husbands from wives, parents from children, forbidding them to speak their own language or practice their own customs and forcing them to violate the tapus of their culture whose mana was based on the rejection of violence. Was this a superior form of colonization to that imposed by European on Māori? Did it respect the dignity and the customs of the colonized? Did it acknowledge the mana whenua of the Chakat Henu or indigenous people of the Chathams? It did not. It was what might now be called an exercise in ethnic cleansing. When Bishop Selwyn arrived in the Chatham Islands in 1848, it was to discover that the Māori called Moriori paraiwhara, or blackfellows. And it was to report that the Moriori population continued to decline at a suicidal rate as a consequence of kōngenge, or despair. Moriori slaves were not released and New Zealand law not established on the islands until 1862, 20 years after they had become part of New Zealand. And it is that 20 years of neglect of fiduciary duty on the part of the Crown that was the basis for the Moriori claim to the Waitangi Tribunal, heard in 1994, but still not reported on. The point in raising the Chathams' experience is not to use it as a stick with which to beat Māori, especially in view of what I've been saying about not vesting the sins of the fathers or the mothers onto subsequent generations. I draw attention to it in the spirit of the historian who says, take care. The evidence of history is unanimous on one point only. It shows us that no race or culture is inherently superior or inferior to another, and we all have skeletons in our ancestral closets that represent instances of behavior of which we cannot be wholly proud uh, by today's standards of ethics and morality. There is another issue which falls within the context of Jack Lazenby's quote about the respective balance between valuing and devaluing our major cultures, and it is exemplified most emphatically, I believe, by the behaviour of our National Museum, Te Papa. This excellent institution made an early decision to recognise and provide access to Matauranga Māori, Māori systems of knowledge, alongside westerly scholarly conventions. And by doing so, to provide the country's indigenous and Pacific cultures with the major say in how their cultures would be represented in the museum's displays. Thus, notices in the museum ask visitors to respect the values and protocols arising out of those cultures. 
Thus, too, those same visitors are asked to remove their shoes before entering the meeting house, te hau ki tauranga. And thus, at the request of New Zealand Samoans, Tongans and other Polynesians, pictures of bare-breasted women taken by European photographers in the 19th century and early 20th centuries were not hung into Papa's Pacific section because such images are offensive to the evangelical Christian mores of the descendants of those same women. So far, so good. I have no grounds for wanting to challenge such a policy. But I am made uneasy by the fact that when an issue arose about the mores and sensibilities of a section of our Pākehā culture, Christians who venerated the Mother of Christ every bit as reverentially as Poverty Bay Māori venerated the carvings in Te Hau Ki Tūdonga, there was no sign of mutuality of respect. The Virgin in a condom was allowed to remain on display regardless of the offence that it gave. I was made even more uneasy when, at the very same time, the Waikato Museum of Art and History decided to withdraw a Dick Frizzell exhibition on the grounds that moko on the face of a caricatured four-square grocer gave offence to Tainui Māori. The message that emerged from the exact conjunction of both episodes was that Tangata Whenua culture is to be respected by the institutions responsible for New Zealand art and ethnology, but Pākehā culture, our second indigenous culture, is not. There was one further episode involving Te Papa that seemed to reinforce this message. Four professional historians, and I was not one of them, wrote last year to Te Papa's chief executive, uh, Cheryl Southerham, complaining that the Moriori exhibit made no mention of the Maori invasion of the Chathams, to which I've already referred. Defending Te Papa's representation of Moriori history, the museum's manager of research, Ken Gorby, went on the Holmes program to say, and I quote, a revelation of the truth in this matter would constitute a return to a view of history which has overtones of racism, end of quote. Again, I was left feeling uncomfortable. The defence implied that aspects of the past ought to be suppressed if they give comfort to rednecks. That, I would argue, is not a sound ground for misrepresenting history, and I'm not sure I can think of any justifiable reason for doing so. The only healthy way to deal with the past and to understand it, it seems to me, is to have all the relevant incidents and episodes on the table and to be even-handed in the manner in which we deal with them. This last episode raises the question of whether or not, in an effort to compensate Māori for past injustices and misrepresentations, some of us are now presenting history slanted in such a way as to make Māori history and behaviour appear more virtuous than the behaviour and performance of non-Māori. The Māori historian Buddy Mikaire has referred to a tendency on the part of Pākehā historians, one of whom was me, to depict Māori as invariably deeply spiritual beings who only ever act on the basis of high-minded principles, and Pākehā as unprincipled rogues or fools whose behaviour is always motivated by racial arrogance, greed and self-interest. Mikaire made these comments uh, in review of specific books, but the imprint of the approach to history he identifies can be found, for example, in Anne Salmon's book, Two Worlds, First Meetings Between Māori and Europeans, though interestingly enough, not in its sequel, Between Two Worlds. It rests heavily on James Billich's series of television documentaries on the New Zealand wars, and it is there in Fergus Clooney's recent writings on missionary activity in and around the Bay of Islands. In the first instance, that of Anne Salmon, it is revealed in a determination to expose the more brutal features of 17th and 18th century European society without acknowledging comparable, comparable behaviour by Māori and to judge every aspect of European activity in New Zealand in the harshest light and every manifestation of Māori behaviour in the most benevolent and positive way. Belich's documentaries highlight the behaviour of the, sorry, highlight behaviour of the nincompoop variety whilst portraying Māori as almost always making decisions that were morally admirable and strategically sound and Fergus Clooney sees early missionary actions as being designed not to give Māori the benefit of European technology in such areas as food production and house construction, but solely to make Māori dependent on the technology with a view to advancing the process of colonisation and parting them with their land. It is true, as Billich remarks, that all the encounters referred to in each of these books result from European intrusions into a previously 
discrete indigenous culture, <coughs> and that consequently, from a post-colonial perspective, Māori in the 18th and 19th century can be seen as always occupying the moral high ground, just as Moriori do in the context of their experience of colonisation. But it is also true, as Makari points out, that Māori too sometimes acted precipitately, unwisely, injudiciously, and that Māori historical narratives about themselves are as replete with fools and clowns and villains as they are with heroes and heroines. One of the features that has always characterised the writing of history is an impulse to restore balance after an interval of perceived imbalance. Hence, like the workings of a clock, the forward motion of history is often generated by pendulum swings. And the examples of imbalance I have offered are themselves the consequence of previous imbalances. Salmons against the, a former inability or unwillingness to perceive the process of cultural encounter from Maori perspectives. Belichers against a tradition of military history that was both racially arrogant and culturally chauvinistic. And Clooney's against a literature on missionary activity whose major distinguishing characteristic was filial piety. Having noted that, however, I would go on to say that the kinds of history that portray Māori as acting only with nobility and Pākehā acting only with malice and self-interest are as patronising and as offensive as an earlier generation of historical narratives which either ignored the Māori role in the national equation or wrote off Māori strategies as the ineffective antics of a savage people. Idealisation of Māori behaviour also builds up a paradigm in which it becomes difficult to accommodate other episodes in New Zealand history, such as the periodic cruelty of Māori to other Māori. Ultimately, historians have a responsibility to reflect all the variegations of human behaviour in these islands, to follow evidence wherever it leads, and not to write narratives that simply caricature one side or the other. And I'll close, if I may, just by reading the concluding passages from this book, Being Pākehā, because it brings, in a way, these themes together, and it also takes us back to the theme of spirituality, which perhaps has been um, overtly omitted from what I was saying uh, previously. I finish the book in this way. Like Māori, Pākehā people are showing renewed interest in their cultures of origin. In the initial trauma of migration, links with old countries were often put aside by settlers anxious to re-establish their lives in a new land and conscious that they would never be able to afford trips back home when home lay inaccessibly on the other side of the globe. In an age of air travel, however, such pilgrimages have become commonplace and many Pākehā people have rediscovered that the experience of being an Irish New Zealander or a Scottish New Zealander has a different flavour from that of being a Polish or a Chinese New Zealander. And in the interest of individual and social integration, Pākehā New Zealanders have as much need to live in harmony with their roots as Māori New Zealanders. For myself, life is inescapably conditioned by the Irish Catholic childhood, by the love of words and music that that background bequeathed to me, as it is by the passion for history and for the life of the bush, the coast and the sea that grew out of my early years at Parramatta. These fundamental experiences provide the magnetic core which has attracted and held the iron filings of additional experiences, my formal education, my interaction with other New Zealanders, my encounter with Māori, travel abroad, all of which combine to make up my character in my own brand of New Zealand Pākehā identity. For me then, to be Pākehā on the cusp of the 21st century is not to be European, it is not to be an alien or a stranger in my own country, it is to be a non-Māori New Zealander who is aware of and proud of my antecedents, but who identifies as intimately with this land, as intensively and as strongly as anybody Māori. It is to be, as I have already argued, another kind of Indigenous New Zealander. Like Bernard Shaw, and indeed like almost anyone with a knowledge of the past behaviour of our species, I feel that, history, that the history of humankind is shameful, but, there are, but that there are grounds for hope in bits of it. Pessimism of the intellect jostles with optimism of the will, and a large part of that optimism springs from the continuing discovery of old truths. The most profound satisfactions are to be found in living a life in accord with the natural world, exercising the human capacity for friendship and altruism, 
engaging in creative and purposeful activity, and experiencing an allegiance to one's origins. It is insufficient, however, to hear such a message. One has to experience it to know that things are so. And I have been blessed in that respect. All the features that once excited me about a particular corner of my country as I gazed through the dusty windows of a Woolsey 444 40 years ago excite me still. That was a reference to a family holiday in the Coromandel Peninsula in the 1950s. Now I look through other windows. Now I see them through other windows. In the mornings when we wake, we look in one direction and see a rewa rewa tree, Frank Sargison's potent symbol of New Zealand identity, backdrop by a curtain of ferns. From the other window, we look out on a volcanic escarpment that was once surmounted by a fortified power. The summit is crowned with pines from an old state forest planting, the slopes clothed in Niko, Pururi and Bahutikawa. In the foreground stands a grove of gigantic poplar, a relic of the time when the land between us and the sea was farmed. If we watch long enough, we see wood pigeons swoop and loop in their spectacular territorial displays. When the windows are open, it is to the morning song of tui and bellbirds. It would be possible, from the evidence within sight and sound of those two windows, to deduce much of the surrounding land's natural and human history. The geological features are visible and the regenerating flora and fauna. That same view is witness to nature's capacity to recover from past abuse, for this is also a landscape that has been logged, burned over and mined. In just over 100 years, it has reassembled its elements and reasserted its healing powers. Even a kiwi has returned and we hear its shrill cry as it feeds in the bush around the house at night. It is in this healing process that I apprehend what I would now call God. Not the image of our childhood, the old man with a long beard in the sky who intervened in human affairs when necessary to unleash floods, deliver tablets of stone or deposit, deposit his son. That was a metaphor that sought to make sense of the complexities of the human psyche, an image made in our own likeness. The God I discern now is infused in the host of good and honest men and women who make up the underlying fabric that holds communities like ours together and in those regenerative powers of the natural world. In the rise of mist from the estuary and the fall of rain, in the movement of the incoming and outgoing tides, I see a reflection of the deepest mystery and the most sustaining pattern in all of life, that of arrival and departure, of death and regeneration. And in seeing them, I feel satisfaction. I am thankful that this piece of earth exists and we upon it to see and to experience these things, and, thanks to the miracle of human consciousness, to know that we experience them. Thank you. Um, there is, seems to be plenty of time for questions, um, so we can go to it until I call us to a halt at 9.30. Uh, would you like to come and take the questions, please? And when we say questions, we mean comment or discussion or disagreement as well. I would welcome any feedback or comment or queries. Yes, down the back. I was interested in your reference to the term tawiwi, which in some parts of the country seems to be de rigueur uh, for uh, reference to the Pakeha people. In the Methodist Church, for example, I know that that is the term that has to be used. And um, I just would like you to expand on that a, a little bit because I, f I find it offensive. Well, I, I, I suppose I don't really want to expand any further than what I've already said. The, ex the root meaning of the expression is people from another place and it was the Maori expression to convey uh, aliens or foreigners and I think there was certainly some justification for that expression being used in relation to non-Māori in the 19th century when these people were new arrivals. Although, strangely enough, one doesn't find it at all in the 19th century literature in Māori. Even in the 19th century, one finds Pākehā people referred to as Pākehā very consistently, um, very consistently from about 1860. 
Um, but the expression first appears in literature in about 1814, 1815. Um, you're quite right. In some places it has become the um, um, accepted expression, the official expression. Massey University, for some reason, uh, passed at council level a policy saying that this was to be the way in which um, non-Māori people were referred to. Um, like you, I find it offensive because it does have connotations of people who don't belong, whereas the word Pākehā has never really had those connotations. It was simply a descriptive term. Um, as I say, I find the word Pākehā absolutely acceptable. Um, it's normally used in a, by Māori as well as by Pākehā in a way that is um, completely inoffensive as far as I'm concerned, whereas any expression which implies that I'm someone who doesn't belong in this country, I would, I would tend to resist. I suspect it's one of those things that came out of a discussion which didn't go on long enough to tease out all the implications. And I think we're all aware, one of the consequences of what's been going on the last 15 years is that a lot of New Zealand institutions, particularly those with a government link, have made a very real effort to adjust rapidly to Māori values and expectations. And in some cases it's because of things like um, principles of the treaty clauses uh, entrenched in legislation or in mission statements. And I think, I suspect that in areas where Tauiwi came into use, some Māori opinion was consulted about this. The Māori opinion that was consulted was of the opinion that that was the expression that should be used and that was adopted rather too quickly by officialdom without really subjecting the term to scrutiny and debate. And I would hope that it is now being subjected to scrutiny and debate. It's not a major thing, but it's just one of those things that seems to strike an unnecessary element of disharmony in the discourse between Māori and Pākehā people. Yes. We had some other hands up. Yes, over here. I wonder whether you'd uh, just like to comment on the, uh, uh, the, the theme of the uh, advertisements and so on which have been appearing in the newspapers recently uh, featuring names and names, lots of uh, New Zealanders who uh, are dissatisfied with conditions here, wanting something different, some changes made which will command better the loyalty of uh, young enterprising people. Well, I find this whole thing a bit strange because for the whole of my lifetime there have always been a percentage of New Zealanders who have gone overseas at a young age very quickly. We were having a discussion at the table last night and um, about half the people with whom I was close friends at university left New Zealand as soon as they graduated um, for a variety of reasons but including reasons of wanting to earn more money and have more professional opportunities seems to me that process has always been going on. I don't think I've yet seen any evidence to show that it's more marked now than it was previously, and it does look suspiciously like um, this new crusade, it looks suspiciously like um, a crusade with a political agenda, I mean a partisan political agenda, and I think the fact that the, the initial advertisement was um, sponsored by the Business Roundtable, and the fact that that was not at first acknowledged uh, speaks volumes. Uh, I think it's, there will always be a section of people who want to go abroad quickly, I mean young people, to either extend their experience uh, or to have professional opportunities they won't get in New Zealand, and in some instances to earn more money. And you will always be able to earn more money in countries with a population of 65 million or 120 million than you will in countries of 3 million. And it could well be that many graduates leaving university with a burden of student debt around their neck have a quite legitimate wish to get rid of that burden of debt as soon as possible by earning as much money as possible. I wouldn't be judgmental about that, but I don't personally think there's anything in the particular combination of social and political circumstances that has erupted since November of last year that is causing people to leave the country in droves. I don't see it. <laughs> I'm very happy to acknowledge our history as an essential component of our spirituality, whatever that means. But I, um, I'm one who would claim, not being an historian, that there is no objective history anyway. So I'm going to challenge you to look forward a hundred years, and looking back from 
that hundred years, what are the main features of the history we will tell of Aotearoa? Well, there were several things I'd say about that. <clears throat> One is that although I agree with you that there's no such thing as um, objective history, I would, however, say that there is more objective history and less objective history. And rather than use the terms objective and subjective, I prefer to say, I prefer to speak in terms of history which either corresponds or doesn't correspond to the evidence. So bad history for me is not what I would call subjective history, it would be history that is not in accord with the evidence. Um, and that's one of the reasons that history changes over the years. Um, perhaps I should also just pick up that element of spirituality in history because, of course, one of the things I was not saying, I was not advocating that one has to be completely in accord with everything that's in one, one's historical, ethnic, spiritual or religious um, background. And in my own case, the influences of Irish Catholicism, uh, which I feel were benign, the ones I have talked about, the love of language, the love of music, the way you, the way you celebrate death. Um, those are the very ones I've retained because they are benign. <laughs> there are other elements of an Irish Catholic background that I've chosen not to retain because I don't see them as being benign. And I think all of us make these kinds of decisions throughout our life just as we make decisions looking at the, the smorgasbord of ethnic elements in our background and choosing which ones we want to identify with. Um, and this is perfectly legitimate. Somebody like Kerry Hume has been savagely criticised by the critic C.K. Stead because she chooses to call herself a Māori writer and she's only one sixteenth Māori. Well, I say good on her. I mean, if that's the part of her background she most identifies with, if that is the culture she has chosen to equip herself in, and if that is the culture in which she is accepted as Māori, that's, that's, she has every right to do that. Um, but coming to the substance of your question, I, I'm actually really going to decline to answer it because historians are very, very good at making sense of the world retrospectively and notoriously reckless in their prophecies. <laughs> and one could write a whole book about the prophecies of historians that have not only not come to pass, they've come nowhere near accuracy. I mean, one that springs to mind was the... Harvard man who wrote a long piece for the New York Times in 1890 pointing out that by the year 1930 movement of traffic in New York would be absolutely impossible because of the height of horse dung that would now be littering the streets <laughs> on account of the number of horses required to carry the population around. So, you know, one has to be very careful about those things. But I could, I could point out some of the things that one assumes are going to happen. I mean, there will continue to be, of course, intermarriage between and among Māori and Pākehā and Pacific Islander Māori and Pākehā. Um, and this will have an effect of enlarging the number of people who identify as Māori. And this will have an effect of making Māori values and Māori customs an even more visible and pervasive part of New Zealand life. Um, as against that, other people from other cultures are going to continue to come into New Zealand. Some of those will marry into that particular cult cultural equation and some won't. So what's going to happen, I think, is that we will continue to have for a very long time what I've called a mainstream culture, a Pākehā culture, and a growing Māori culture. At some point, possibly, that mainstream Pākehā culture is going to shrink in its dimensions commensurate with the expansion of that enlarging Māori culture. But I don't know that for sure. It's what one assumes will happen on present predictions and present growth of population statistics. On the other hand, things might happen in the next 10 or 20 years which render all that um, completely unlikely. I would like to think, as someone, as I said, who is um, intellectually a pessimist but by will an optimist, I would like to think that we're going to move towards greater understanding on cultural issues. But one of the things I wanted to say today, and to say it very strongly, was that for Māori and Pākehā to continue to exist side by side, and for Māori and Pākehā to exist more harmoniously side by side, there has to be 
a mutuality of respect. We've been through a period in my early life where there was, I think it's fair to say, no recognition and no respect of Tangata Whenua culture in the, nat in the national life. We've recently been through a period of, of about 15 to 20 years where a serious effort has been made to rectify that. I think we're now reaching the point where that recognition is getting close to being adequate, not necessarily on the part of every single individual in the country, but on the part of officialdom, on the part of the institutions. And we have to now give considera consideration to balancing the equation back to that mutuality of respect. And that is why I say I would never in any kind of forum, this one or even the Maori forum, stand up and apologize for being who I am or for the culture I came from. And I would not expect to be attacked because of the culture that I came out of. That's what I mean by mutuality of respect. And that I see as a sign of national maturity, which we haven't yet achieved, but which I hope we're working towards. We've got one more coming. Yes. Yeah. Have time for one more? Yes. Oh, mine might be a short one. I wondered whether you would care to comment on what you think might be the influence on Pākehā thinking of uh, the Parihaka exhibition at the Wellington City Gallery. The influence on Pākehā what? Thinking. Oh, thinking. Yes, I'm yes, sorry. sorry. I'm not yes. hearing very well, and I thought for one terrible moment you said the influence on Pākehā cooking. <laughs> <laughs> And I was trying to work that one out. Um, it, it just reminds me, and I will come to the question, but it just reminds me, some years ago, when I was working in the reading room of the Turnbull Library, the staff came in in a terrible um, uh, kerfuffle first thing in the morning to say that I hadn't signed my name in the visitor's book and written my topic of research. And, and I hadn't, because I'd been coming in every day for about six months. And I, and I said, well, why do I need to do it today? And they said, because the minister in charge of the National Library is coming and he's doing an official ministerial visit. We want everything to be in order. And I said, who is that? Not even sure at that stage. It was such a low-profile portfolio. And I said, Lockwood Smith. So I went out to the visitor's book and I signed my name. And under topic of research, just to intrigue him, and I hope to engage him with a conversation, I wrote, the influence of Inca pottery on New Zealand road building. <laughs> and... <laughs> I then, I then went back to the reading room and I waited with a mounting sense of excitement for Lockwood Smith to arrive. And sure enough, in due course he arrived and he was a bit like um, the way doctors used to be on their rounds in the hospital. He was striding out the front and the senior staff of Turnbull National Library were walking behind him, looking anxious, and he came into the um, office part of the uh, manuscript section. He looked around, somebody pointed to him the visitor's book, so he went and looked at it, and I waited with great glee to see his reaction. He read it, his facial expression didn't change at all, and he turned around and walked out again. So, <laughs> Anyway, I'm sorry, the, I have to say, I, I haven't yet seen the Parry Harker exhibition uh, in Wellington. And strangely enough, I'm going to be in Wellington tomorrow, and I'm going to uh, see it tomorrow. I hope it's a story that every New Zealander is uh, familiar with, or becomes familiar with, because it's significant at two levels. One is that it represents the absolute nadir of our record of colonisation once the colonists took control of the New Zealand government. Um, that, if you like, is its, its example, its, its negative value uh, educationally. The positive value is just to make more people familiar with uh, Te Whiti o Rongamai and Tohu Kākehi, who were two remarkable Māori political and spiritual leaders. And Te Whiti, of course, rightly identified as a person who was thinking about and practicing not only um, a process, a strategy of passive resistance as a moral imperative, but as an actual strategy for dealing with um, more powerful forces, in this case, New Zealand colonial government. It's also a very sad story because um, Parihaka has never really recovered from the damage of that invasion and its aftermath, uh, it's been a very run-down and divided community until quite recently. But it does have that marvellous repository of moral and spiritual authority there in its background, and one hopes that it's going to 
use that as a foundation on which to build again a strong Maori spiritual and cultural movement and one hopes that it's one of the uh, influences of Maori history and culture that will have a continuing um, influence on Pākehā people and culture. That would certainly be my hope. Um, I'm sure everybody's enjoyed it. There may be one or two more questions and you may be able to catch up with Dr. King um, fairly soon. Uh, we'll be going to core groups next, but it's my pleasure to thank him. There will be no reprimands, and anyway, there won't be any memoirs, so you're quite safe there. Uh, when we talk about putting faith into action, we infer from that that we are going to act in a way that honours our own ethics. And I think as a historian, you've demonstrated to us today that you honour your ethics and your roots in the bush by your honesty and your even-handed approach to how you view things and try to present it. A talk like yours can be actually somewhat healing. That was the feeling I felt as you talked about some of the guilt and the, the imposed guilt from outside that can come from comments in the media and other sources. Allegiance and by inf inference loyalty to your roots is deeply rooted, rooted within us. And I have to thank you very, very sincerely on behalf of everyone for the clear way you've spoken today and the wonderful talk you've given. Thank you very much, Dr. King. <laughs>